I mean, he's practically dating a model. She told me they went to Cabo, and he paid for the whole thing. Dude, she does his laundry and cooks. He proposed at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Bro, she plays in his fantasy football league and knows more about the Cowboys than he does. She's got the husband, the house. She's got it all. What more could you ask for? Well, good evening here in Dallas, and uh, we've never met before. My name is Garrett, and I typically spend my Tuesday nights uh, about 40 miles west over in Fort Worth. So hey to our satellite uh, audience in Fort Worth and uh, in Houston, and uh, we want everyone tuning in to know that there's a new group um, gathering in North Houston in the Woodlands, and so that's starting just tonight um, for the porch live down in the Woodlands. So glad that all you guys are are with us this evening. I'm going to read the text uh, that we're going to be in tonight, and then pray one more time, and we'll get started. 1 Corinthians Chapter six, starting in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's pray together one more time. God, I pray that we would glorify you in body, in thought, in spirit, in truth, completely, God, that we would honor you, that we would be attentive to your word this evening. We trust you to meet us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, when I was in high school, one night I walked into church. The only background you would need to know is that I was not a a church person. I had been around church kind of when I was a kid, you know, Christmas, Easter, and I guess any other time that uh, my dad took me or my mom took me, which was not super frequently. And so I, um, when I was in high school, I was not even, I didn't even pretend to have a relationship with Jesus. I didn't pretend to bring his um, morals, his teaching, his book into my life. I did not even um, pretend, I, didn't, I wouldn't even imitate um, a Christian. And so I walk into church one night, I guess I just wanna say hi and like see some friends. I was completely living an immoral lifestyle, partying, sex, whatever I wanted to do, and uh, unbeknownst um, to my loved ones. And so that's kind of where I was living and hanging out. And I go to church one night, and it's a Wednesday night, you know, small town Baptist church. I lived in small town Texas. And we're having um, this thing at the church that night, which I rarely attended, called True Love Waits. I'm like, okay, what is this true love waits thing? And so I just kind of wander in. It feels a little different. The normal youth pastor's not there. There's some like new guy in there and uh, it's like some dude in his 20s with a microphone attached to his face and you're like, you know how that goes. And uh, (laughs) so I I see him. I'm like, who is this guy? And come to find out, true love waits is like a sexual purity rally. I'm at a sexual purity pep rally. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. (laughs) And this guy, this guy (laughs) stands up there And he starts to say crazy things that he claims the Bible says, crazy things, things that I could not like put together or even begin um, to accept, not even close. And so he started to say things like, um, sex is for marriage, one man, one woman. He started to say that there was um, no oral sex would be pleasing to God outside of marriage, like fantasy's not gonna help you, masturbation, self-simulation, manual stimulation, any kind of stimulation. He's just like wrecking my whole operation. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I got, this guy's leaving me no options. I hate this guy right now. I have no idea like what to do, no kidding. And so like I'm sitting there in my seat and I'm like, I, I, I don't know why. Like I don't know why he's telling me these things. I don't know why that's important. Like, how could that be important? And so I'm like arguing with him in my head. I'm like, okay, clearly this guy's never had sex. Let's give him a break. (laughs) I'm like, okay, um, is that even healthy? I mean, is it like even healthy? Is it even possible for like a post-pubescent male to even make it through life without having sex? Is that even like a reality? And so I'm like scratching my head. I'm arguing with him. I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm not okay with this. This is not okay. And I just had no answers for why. And I don't know how well he communicated that night. Honestly, I was just closed off. I didn't care. It didn't matter. Maybe he said it and I couldn't hear it. Maybe he didn't say why and therefore I didn't hear it but I do know that I could not figure out why P 
purity, that word, I was so entrenched in my own lifestyle and in my own choices that the word itself sounded like nails on a chalkboard to me. True story. It bothered me. And tonight, in a great irony, here we are. (laughs) And we are gonna talk about sexual purity. And uh, I want you to know I consider it a great privilege. And I'm so excited about it. And uh, I know um, tonight that you may not, um, you may be where I was. Like some of you, I know you're gonna walk out of here and like you're gonna have sex tonight. Like I know, maybe I'll scare you out of it for one night, maybe tomorrow night, I don't know. Some of you are like closed off, like 100% closed off. It doesn't matter what I say, I could beg, I could beg, plead, yell, I could do anything, and uh, it's just not gonna convince you. But I hope, even if you're there, I hope you'll at least be able to answer the question that I could not, why? Why purity? Even if you don't believe it, even if you're not ready to walk in it, I hope that you'll at least know why purity. So we'll be in one of the most famous passages on sexuality in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter six. So Paul is writing to Corinthian Christians who are about as impure as you can get sexually, and he writes some things that will explain if we look closely why purity is so critical. So 1 Corinthians chapter six, verse 15. Do you not know, he just assumes people know these things. We don't, we need help. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do you not know that your body, like a body part, like your body is just one body part. Your whole body is one body part attached to Christ. Shall I then take what is Christ, because you're attached to him, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Do I really wanna be the link in the chain that holds together prostitution immorality in Christ? Do I wanna be the link in the chain that holds that together? He says, never. Or do you not know, he loves to use this phrase, you're gonna have to get used to that tonight. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? You're like, I knew that one. That's like a one body thing. Two bodies become one body. For as it is written, and he quotes Genesis, the two will become one flesh. God's original design before sin, God's pro-sex, he created sex. And it, and it says, <laughs> you're the one I'm worried about. <laughs> oh, I got 30 minutes to do this, people, let's go. <laughs> For as it is written, the two will become one flesh, God's design. But he put it in a particular place for a particular reason. The first reason for why purity is very simple, they all are. It's one, because sex is powerful. Sex is powerful. I hope you remember that, I hope you don't ever forget it. Sex is powerful. You're like, oh, I know. No, that's not what I mean. I mean on a deeper level, it's powerful. So the men in Corinth, um, who were Christians, um, had about as loose of a sexual ethic as you could possibly have. And so if you were in Corinth, they were basically running the liberal experiment of the day. And so you can do anything you want and nobody's allowed to tell you that your sexual desire is wrong. I don't know if that sounds familiar, but in Corinth, it was a land where you could claim anything you wanted for your sexual preference and no one was able to tell you no. And so the Corinthian Christian men, Christian men, not just men, Christian men would consider it totally okay, totally permissible to have sex with their wife, and then if they were feeling like they needed a release, or she was feeling uncreative, or maybe had that headache, you know, that comes around, and so maybe if that was going on, they could just go right on down to the prostitute, to a prostitute, and get whatever they wanted, and pay pay money for it. And so that was considered perfectly acceptable, it was like, oh, my body needs this, and so I'm gonna go do that, and Paul speaks to that, and he says, don't you know you're attached to Christ? This thing is so much more powerful than you think it is, You are attached to the living God, physically, spiritually, emotionally. You are messing with something that is far more powerful than you think you are. God designed it to bring two bodies together. There is no greater act of intimacy. It is powerful. And some things are really just too powerful to play with, too powerful to take a chance on. I've got some family uh, in East Texas, that's where I grew up, and uh, way East Texas, okay, so I grew up, I'm gonna lose trust with some of you, but I'm talking about like I grew up shooting guns, riding horses, trucks, I loved them. I lost my accent when I moved to the city, um, but you know, it comes out whenever I go down there. Um, so uh, we go down there every once in a while and we still like to shoot guns for fun. And, uh, and so, and the occasional explosive, you never know, there's lots of pasture out there, I'm not making this up. Some of you guys are like, are you serious? I'm so serious. And so um, we will uh, we'll go out there and enjoy that every once in a while and we have something that we do every single time. It's so simple, we never even think about it. We just do it. 
when we get the guns, we gotta get them out of something, right? Out of a box with a lock. We gotta get it out of the safe because you don't just leave powerful things laying around. You don't just leave something that's really powerful where somebody could just like trip over it and then injure themselves. You don't leave something that's really powerful in the hands of someone who could abuse it. You don't leave something that's really powerful in a place where it's gonna allow people that you love to be hurt. God put something powerful in a specific place for a specific reason, namely safety. And I know that sounds crazy, that sounds constricting, that sounds like a preacher's trick, you're not having it. Listen, let me ask you something. Let's pretend for a second that you were God, like you're in charge, and you're looking at the world, and you can see what we as a human race have done with sex. And by the way, if you're God, you love every human, that's part of the requirement. And so you're looking at a planet full of people that you love, and you see STDs, you see AIDS, gonorrhea, syphilis, you see it all, you see rape, you see intimidation, you see pain and abuse, and then you have the option to choose that, or you can put sex in marriage, only, like lock it and throw away the key. What would you do? You'd put it in the safe. That's exactly what you would do. Be careful before you blame God. He's looking for your good. Sex is powerful. He puts it in a specific place for a good reason. He is not holding out on you. He is protecting you. But it's not just a powerful physical act. It's more than that. It goes even further. Look at verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one, what? What was it? Spirit. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one, all the campuses, becomes one, Spirit with him, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. In other words, in other words, there's something uniquely deep striking about sexual mistakes. There's something that's uniquely powerful on the upside when sex is used appropriately. Sex is an act of the soul. 100% of the time. So we already know, hey, if you have sex with a prostitute, one body. But just like you're in a spiritual union with Christ, when you have a sexual interaction of any kind, of any kind, even against yourself, you are going to damage yourself or another person if you do that outside the safe place that God has designed it to be. And it is a spiritual act. It may be bodies that are moving, and there should be if you're having sex. But you're, not just, but you're not just moving your body, you're touching someone's soul. You are using their body to move their soul. That is what sex is. There is no such thing as a sexual act that is not spiritual. That's like just by definition. Like you cannot, cannot ever have sex that's just physical. It's always spiritual, that's my second Point tonight. Why purity? Why purity? One, sex is powerful. Number two, sex is not just physical. It is not just physical. And our world and our culture promote sex as purely physical. You ever heard that? Ah, oh, it's just physical. I heard that recently, really recently. Hey man, is that girl, are you dating that girl? No nah, man, we're just hooking up. Just a physical thing. Incorrect. That's not true. No, you're not. It's always spiritual, 100% of the time. Your union to Christ is not just physical, it's spiritual, so it is with sex. The world you see, if you are in a sexual relationship, the world you see and the world that you see that you're manipulating affects a world you cannot see, namely the immaterial part of a person, the non-material part of a person, that thing that makes you human, that thing that creates emotion, that part about you that's you, I mean really you. Did you know that you don't, um, that you're not a body? You, I mean you, you, like your name, who you are, you're not a body, you just have a body. You are a soul, that's who you are. And if you're having sex with a person, for better or for worse, inside of marriage or out, by very definition, the act is a spiritual act. 
You cannot have sex and have it not be spiritual. Now, when you get inside of a marriage um, and you start to pursue it, you would be better off to pursue it in the spiritual sense because it's meant to be intimacy that brings two people together, not just a physical act. But 100% of the time, for better or worse, you are committing a spiritual act. Trying to have sex and not um, getting spiritual is like trying to jump out of a boat in the ocean and not get wet. Like, that's just not gonna happen. There's no way. When someone has damaged themselves, or when someone, think about this, so I I work on a church staff and that means I get to have a lot of conversations with folks that I love a ton, and when someone pulls me aside and they say, psst, I gotta tell you something. They're not about to tell me that they're sad that they talked back to mama when they were nine. They're about to tell me that something that they did with their body, hey, psst, I've never told anybody this before. I don't feel good about it. It's because of a sexual act that has damaged them deep within. It's not unhealable. And I'm not trying to discourage you. I just want us to agree on one thing is best for Abel. Sex is powerful and it's not just physical. And I, don't, I, hate, I hate it when people think that it's just physical and pretend it's just physical because we don't even believe it. I promise you, we don't even believe it. When it really gets down to it, we don't even believe it. Let me show you. Pretend for a second. This is gonna be, be kind of dark. I'm warning you. It's gonna make you feel kind of weird. But imagine the person that you love a lot decides to cheat on you and then the person they cheated on you with comes to you and they say, hey bro, I'm sorry man, it was just physical, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> oh no, bro, it's gonna be physical when I hit you in the mouth, that's, what, that's when it's gonna be just physical. We know, like the problem here is that there was, an, there was an heart exchange. You took the deepest part of my person and the deepest part of my person went to you. That's not okay, I'm not okay with that. It's not just physical, you don't even believe that. It's not just physical. In fact, so think through this with me. And like, I wanna be gentle with your story. I don't wanna pretend to have fast answers or fast solutions. If you told me your story, um, it would probably take a while and it would probably leave us both um, in a sensitive place. And so I don't wanna just like dive into that and pretend I know what you've been through. But I do know this, just by pattern recognition, if someone has been harmed physically, like an altercation, like a fight, like an assault, something like that, they are likely, not every time, but they are likely to bounce back quicker than someone who has experienced sexual abuse, right? And that's the story for many of you. The statistics on women would say one in four. That's a lot of women in this room and many men in this room. And if you are one of those affected, or even if you are a former offender, you know that there's something about that wrong that just goes deeper than your skin. There's something about that that just doesn't sit right with you. It's because sex is not just physical. It is powerful, it is spiritual by definition, but the good news is God designed it to be that way, and it's recoverable. Let's look at verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. That is good news. Whom you have from God. And so God has decided that he's not just gonna sit back and be angry at anybody. He's gonna give us a good gift, like help us combat this problem that we've adopted onto ourselves. And it says God has given us the Holy Spirit who lives within us. The word temple um, just means like a dwelling place. And it's rich in biblical terms because um, in in the Old Testament times, the temple Um, was not something that could house God because God is infinitely, um, he is unsizable, he is not, he is immaterial himself, God is spirit. But the temple was the um, symbol of God's dwelling place. And so the temple is you, if you are a believer in Christ. Your body is the dwelling place of God and the sign to the rest of the world that God's here. You are not your own. Now that is about as anti-American as it gets. You are not your own. You are not in charge of you. For you were bought with a price. Someone bought you. Someone bought you. Not a slave master, someone who is here to set you free. For you were bought with a price. So, so glorify your free, loving God with your body. This is the most encouraging part for me. The most. You see right there where it says, the Holy Spirit within you, you would wanna know that the Holy Spirit is a gift that God gives when he wants to give something good. 
Anytime God, someone needs help, if someone, when David had sinned sexually, Psalm 51, renew a right spirit within me. When God promised to help the people of the Old Testament follow his statutes or rules or laws, he said, I will put my spirit within you and then you will walk in my law. Jesus said, unless I leave, the helper won't come. Meaning the spirit of God, if, I, if Jesus says, when I physically leave this planet, and I will, I am gonna send the helper, the Holy Spirit. He is gonna help you. He's not gonna condemn you. He is going to help you. God is going to give you a helper. Acts 1.8, right around the time the church began, it says, Jesus huddled with the disciples, said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The Holy Spirit being in this equation is a good thing, because I don't know about you, but someone telling me that sex is powerful, and someone telling me that sex is spiritual, and it's never just physical, sometimes um, can make me feel guilty, and it can make me feel like I'm trapped. But if the Holy Spirit enters the equation, it doesn't have to be that way, because it says in the scripture, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that's where freedom is. And so this is where he enters the text in you. This means that God is not just sitting back. Do you see who God is? He's not just sitting back, tapping his foot, angry at this world, angry at you, angry for where you're stuck, and giving you instructions and hoping you get it right and angry when you can't figure out the equation. He is giving you help. Amazing. So my third point is that because of this, purity is possible. It's possible. I'd want you to know that because I know some of you are discouraged to the point where you just say, hey, I I see it, I already knew it it wasn't just physical, I already knew it was powerful, and I've already made enough mistakes, and I've already repetitively made enough mistakes, worse and worse, sometimes it's not getting better, it'll be a little better, and then it's worse, worse, and a little better, and then it's just not worth it anymore. I don't even think this thing is possible if the Holy Spirit is here, why are you gonna argue with the Bible? I mean, it says where the Spirit is, there's freedom, and then it says that the Spirit is in you, so that means freedom is in you, if I'm putting that together right, and you're sitting there saying that freedom can't be in you. Be careful. Purity is possible. Do not give up. God is not demanding the impossible and laughing when you can't do it. That is not who he is. I uh, I rented apartments. Um, for a decade, and so I just bought my first home. I rented apartments for a decade. I have never had a landlord move in with me to help me, ever. They just sit back and ask for the rent. That's what they do. I've had old ones, young ones, men, women, for a decade. I've rented a lot of houses. I've had a lot of roommates. I have never had a landlord move in and help me pay my rent or organize my life or make sure I was putting one step in front of the other. God is nothing like a landlord. He is an owner and a tenant because he moves in with us to help us with what we need. God will not demand from you what he will not provide for you. He will not demand a sexual ethic from you that he will not enable you to take on. It says no temptation is so great that you can't stand up under it. It's possible. God demands purity, there's no question. But he offers forgiveness for what's already been done and he offers hope for what's ahead. So in summary, why purity? Because sex is powerful, sex is not just physical, and purity is possible. I'd, uh, I'd love for you as we close tonight just to see um, a living example um, of what God has done for me. And I'd wanna tell you up front, please hear this. God is so creative, he will never do anything in the same way twice, okay? And so whatever redemption he offered me, maybe it looks like that for you, maybe it doesn't, maybe it looks different, I have no idea. And so I'm not gonna limit God, and I'm also not gonna put a minimum on God. I have no idea what he will do with you. But as it says in the New Testament, I can't help but say what I've seen and heard. And so I'm gonna show you a before and an after, okay? So here's the before of my life. I've already told you a little bit about it. When I walked out of church the night, we were talking about sexual purity. <clears throat> but um, I was completely disengaged from any idea of biblical um, sexuality. I used sex to make me feel like a man. Um, I used sex to create my own pride. Um, I let it separate me from God because I worshiped sex more than God. I did all that. Uh, I, be- I developed an addiction to pornography. And, uh, and with that, um, and suffered a breakup, 
And, uh, and so previously, I'd been so prideful, I thought I could use my words to get anything I wanted, and then all of a sudden, someone broke up with me, and all the mountain of pride I had built for myself turned into a valley of insecurity. I was completely lost, turned to pornography where I could always win, developed a crushing addiction to pornography. And uh, I was so lost, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I choose these words carefully, I literally wished that God would have created the world without men and women to interact in this way. That's how bad I was burned. That's true. That's the before. You got that image in your head? Let me tell you the after. My, uh, my wife and I dated um, for about a year, and uh, during that time, we, uh, we weren't perfect. We did our best. We, uh, we talked um, a lot with our community groups and the people around us and asked for a lot of support and sent a lot of text messages and lots of um, just help and prayer, and um, just we did our best. And it just so happens that our first kiss came at, at an opportune moment, and I know it's kind of a private thing, but I figured I'd share it with you. What I'm trying to do here is I'm not trying to show you that I cleaned myself up, I didn't. I hope you heard what I just said, I didn't. And I hope you are also not hearing me say that if you be pure, there could be a moment like this. That's not the deal, okay? God doesn't, you can't hold God to a deal that he's never made, that's not my point. I am trying to show you, not a moment. Can we show the photo one more time? I'm not even trying to show you a moment. I am trying to show you the power of a God who can change a life. Okay, and there's plenty about the moment that I like. I love it, I love the pretty girl, I love the beach, the guys on the right, that's my brother, my roommate, they're like, oh, I love this, and then they got, you got the girls on the left, they're like, oh my gosh, that's great, but he better calm down, and so like, you get, <laughs> like, I love, I love the moment, but I'm not showing you this to create desire for a moment, I'm trying to tell you that's a changed man. All I can do is tell you that God changed me. I have no idea, that was three weeks ago. I have no idea how we didn't kiss. I have no idea, like just the power of God. <laughs> Last bit of cleanup. I'm not telling you that you should wait to kiss until your wedding day. I'm not creating any rules tonight, okay? We wanted to do what was helpful. Look up above verse 15, it says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. We wanted to choose what was helpful and that was helpful for us. And so we're not creating a rule tonight. That's just where we landed. And through an imperfect journey, God was able to preserve us. God can change anyone. There's not a person that he can't change. There's not a past he can't forgive. And I have no idea what your future little snapshot might look like. It doesn't matter. I don't have any idea what that could look like. But I know this, God is in the business of providing for people what he demands from people. I know that God is in the business of forgiving our iniquities to the highest degree. I know that God is so kind that he is going to be the reason why we make it. And I know when you think about your journey with purity, if you even consider yourself to be on one, that if you look up for too long and see how many steps you have to go, that it can just get overwhelming and it can feel impossible. It is not impossible. God can do anything. That is why, that is why the New Testament says of God, now to the God who is able to keep you from stumbling. That's what it says. And so the question tonight, I'm, to be really frank with you, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna lose our opportunity here. The question tonight is not whether God is good. The question tonight is not whether God is even pro-sex in the right, safe, specific way. The, God, the, the, the question tonight is not whether God intends good for your future. The question tonight is not even whether God is able to keep you from stumbling. The question tonight is simply, do you believe him? Do you believe that God is capable of these things? Do you believe, or are you talking yourself out of it somehow, like, oh, that doesn't apply to me, my sin's too great, way to go, pastor boy, I'm sure he's just showing off. Are you using some way to like talk your way out of it? Open your heart to the God who can change you, and he can, and he will. He's available tonight for you. He loves you, he made you, he made your body, that means 100% of it. He made everything about you, and he's here to redeem. 
Let me pray that he would. Father, thank you, God, that you are so perfect and so pure and so holy that it taxes our faith, God, to think of you as this kind. It taxes our belief, our ability to believe that you would be so kind to us. It is hard, God, for us to believe, to trust that you are as good as you say you are. God, thank you that the, the very first scripture that you helped me memorize was 1 Corinthians six eighteen. flee from the immorality that's gonna wage war against my soul. I pray somebody would know that scripture tonight. Thank you, Father, that you reach out your hands, that you are slow to anger and abounding in love and steadfast and long-suffering, and you do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities, but as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love for those who fear you. So God, I pray we would not just revere you out of fear, God, but that we would trust you because your heart is good. Thank you for the redemption that you're doing in this room, in Fort Worth, and in Houston, in the Woodlands, and around this globe, not because of anything that any human has ever done, but just because you desire to redeem. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's gonna be a, uh, a group of people um, that are wearing a porch t-shirt that uh, gather right up here, guys and girls, and um, here's the deal. They are of wildly different backgrounds. Um, most of them have tasted some of the bitterness of the world. And uh, in some way. And so find someone to, to chat with if you'd like to. They'll be up here um, to pray with you or to answer any questions that you might have. If you just wanna open the scripture with someone, you can meet us right here.